Today we are going to the mid 18th century. So sit back as we go to England. Mary Blandy was born in 1720 in the town of Henley-on-Thames in the county of Oxfordshire. The town was growing in the early to mid 18th century and was well known for the manufacture of glass and malt. It was a very well situated place due to its location by the river, which meant that there were easy transportation links for the 40 mile journey to take goods to London. As the town grew in size, many of its residents benefited from the increased trade and Mary's father, a well-known and well-respected lawyer named Francis Blandy, was able to expand his already busy practice. Her mother, Anne, had lived all her life in Henley-on-Thames and spent her days looking after the house and at various social functions. Mary was an only child and was somewhat spoiled by her parents, but her father did have the presence of mind to educate his daughter and Mary grew up to be intelligent and articulate and was considered to be a polite, respectful and charming young lady. Her parents, Francis and Anne Blandy, were very proud of their only daughter. As Mary grew up, her father, Francis Blandy, like most proud and doting fathers in the 1740s, sought to find his daughter a husband. Mary was a pleasant looking young lady with all the graces befitting someone looking for matrimony. Being an only child, any future husband would inherit all of her parents' money and property. So Mary may have been considered by many families to be a good prospective marriage candidate. It was also reported that she came with a dowry of 10,000 pounds, which further enhanced the interest of eligible young men. Mary would often take afternoon tea with young ladies and go to balls where many preferential suitors would be in attendance. Her mother also took her to spend some time in London and Bath, as Mary's parents considered that a better match may be found in a bigger city. Mary was often approached by young handsome men, who knowing she was an only child with a dowry of 10,000 pounds, were all very happy to propose to her. When a marriage proposal was forthcoming, they would never materialize as Mary's father would often not consider the young man suitable due to him not coming from a wealthy enough family. Or if he did agree with the match and was happy with the suitor, the offer of marriage was later withdrawn when it became known that Francis would not pay the dowry and instead would promise that his daughter's future husband would inherit all of his money when he died. As time passed, Mary had still not secured a husband. In the summer of 1746, William Henry Cranston, an army captain and the youngest son of a Scottish lord, began to pay attention to Mary. His father was Lord Cranston, and although William was described as having a quite ordinary and unremarkable manner, Mary's father encouraged the relationship, thinking that his daughter could be married into an aristocratic family. The young couple would meet and go on long walks beside the river, and they would see each other whenever the captain was able. But despite them becoming engaged, matrimony did not follow. And as time passed, Mary celebrated her 30th birthday, an unmarried woman. By this time, Mary and her mother were starting to be concerned about Mary still being unmarried, as the average age for a young lady to marry in 1740s Britain was 26 years old and Mary's parents wondered why William had not married their daughter. In 1751, Mary's father received a letter from a Scottish Lord named Lord Mark Kerr. Lord Kerr was a great uncle of William and was by all accounts a fine and upstanding gentleman. So Francis Blandy was honored to receive a letter from him. He may have thought that the letter would congratulate him on the engagement of Lord Kerr's great nephew, William to his own daughter, Mary. But when he read it, the contents were altogether quite different. Lord Kerr informed Mary's father that no marriage could take place between William and Mary because William was already married. The letter stated that William had married a local girl named Anne Murray in 1745 
and was the father of her daughter. Francis Blandy was quite devastated by the news. His aspirations for his daughter to marry into a noble family had suddenly been shattered and his daughter was now in her thirties, so the chance of securing a good match for her was looking more remote. It was clear as to why after five years, William had not married Mary and Francis wasted no time in confronting him with the revelation that he was already married. But somewhat unconcerned, William denied the allegation, telling Mary's father that he was not actually married. He claimed that Anne Murray had been his mistress and they had indeed been engaged, but as he was a Protestant and she was a Catholic, they could not marry unless she renounced her faith and joined the Protestant church. This, however, was not something she was prepared to do, so the engagement was broken off. Francis was not convinced by this, as the letter stated that they were married, not merely engaged. William said the marriage was a ruse to satisfy Anne's family, and he assured Francis that the question regarding his marriage was soon going to be heard in the Scottish courts, and when he was vindicated, he would marry Mary. Mary's father, however, was a lawyer, so knew about the legal system, and he wasn't so convinced that William should be so certain that the Scottish courts would annul his marriage. He was extremely angry with his prospective son-in-law and decided that Mary should be discouraged from seeing him and a new suitor should be sought. However, Mary and her mother were more inclined to believe William's interpretation of the situation and Mary was becoming anxious to get married and was under no illusion about the damage to her reputation that would follow if it became common knowledge in her social circle but she had to break off her engagement as her fiancé was already married and it would be yet another obstacle to overcome in any future search for a suitable husband. Mary's mother liked William. He had always been very charming towards her and tried to convince her husband that William Henry Cranston was a good man and that everything would turn out for the best. Shortly after, she became very ill and Mary was very concerned about her mother's health. She attended her, but her condition did not improve, and it was alleged that her last wish before she died was to ask her husband that he should help Mary marry William and not discourage the marriage. However, when the Scottish court delivered their decision, they decreed that William Henry Cranston and Anne Murray were indeed legally married. The court also ordered him to pay his wife an annuity. William appealed the decision, but the appeal was dismissed and he was left humiliated, legally married and engaged. Plus the money he had to pay Anne put him further into debt. Despite this, Mary still supported him. This was somewhat strange as if William still wanted to marry Mary, he would now have to divorce his wife. And in the mid 18th century, the British divorce laws were considered draconian and divorce was a very time consuming and very expensive process. But William was still consumed by the thought of the 10,000 pound dowry. Despite Mary's wishes, her father, Francis Blandy, had had enough of William and instructed his daughter to have nothing more to do with him. Mary may have been a romanticist, but her father was a lawyer and he knew the issues surrounding divorce. So he instructed William to no longer attempt to court his daughter. Mary, however, continued to write to William and William would write back, letting Mary know that he was going to sort out all of his problems. He had a very convincing and persuasive way with words and Mary seemed to believe everything he wrote. In the summer of 1751, William sent Mary a letter which included within it some powder he informed her that if given to her father, it would make him like William and welcome him back into his house. The powder was accompanied by a note instructing Mary to mix the powder with her father's food and in his tea. Mary wondered if his powder would have the desired effect, but decided that it may assist her father upon looking more favourably upon their union, so she would give it a try. In early August, Francis Blandy fell seriously ill he was suffering with stomach pains. Mary continued to prepare his food, which was something she rarely did, but her father's condition did not improve. 
When one of her maids retrieved the half-eaten bowl of oatmeal from the bedroom of Francis Blandy, she decided to eat what was left, and soon after, she too became ill. The maids had noted that Mary's behaviour was somewhat strange, and they started to think that something odd was going on. When Mary's uncle, the Reverend Stevens, arrived, the maids described to him what had been happening in the house and they feared that Mary might be responsible for their master's grave condition. The Reverend informed Francis Blandy, who believing Mary to be a caring and loving daughter, immediately blamed her fiance, Captain William Henry Cranston. When Mary learned that her father had been poisoned, she panicked. She took the letters sent to her by William and the remainder of the powder and put them on the fire. She did not, however, wait to see them burn and they were retrieved, and the maids handed them over to the doctor in attendance, Dr. Norton. The next day, Saturday the 14th of August, 1751, Mary's father's condition worsened. Dr. Norton called for the assistance of another doctor, the well-respected Dr. Anthony Addington. But despite the best efforts of the two men, Francis Blandy died. An autopsy was performed and the coroner concluded that the cause of death was by ingesting arsenic. Tests were performed on the white powder retrieved from the fire and it too was identified to be arsenic. Following this, Mary Blandy was arrested. A warrant was issued for the arrest of Captain William Henry Cranston but when the police arrived to detain him they discovered that he had left Scotland and made his way to France. Mary was left to face the consequences of the crime alone. The trial of Mary Blandy started on Friday, March the 3rd, 1752. The evidence against her was very solid and the maids testified that they had seen her mixing the white powder into her father's food and tea. They also said that she had on occasion spoken ill of her father, referring to him in an undignified manner. Mary's defence was only that she believed she had given her father nothing more than a powder that was meant to help him become more amenable towards her fiancé. The defence was remarkably weak and the fact that even though her father had suddenly became ill, she continued to administer the powder compounded the case against her. In his closing address to the court, the judge summarised the case by saying, the jury must decide as to whether the accused served the powder to her father in the knowledge that it was poison and in the knowledge as to what effect it would have on him. But the jury only deliberated for five minutes before returning to find the defendant, Mary Blandy, guilty and the judge sentenced her to death by hanging. The case had very much divided public opinion Whilst many thought it inconceivable that an educated lady could have been so innocent as to mistake arsenic for a potion to make her father like her fiancé, others thought that Mary had lived a sheltered life, protected by her parents, and that the scoundrel, Captain William Hendry Cranston, had duped her into poisoning her father so he could benefit from her inheritance when Francis Blandy died. In the six weeks before her execution, Mary maintained her innocence and wrote her version of events. This was printed and the story of how she became the victim of a great deception was sold across the country and Mary Blandy became an 18th century household name. While in prison, Mary learned that she was a sole beneficiary of her father's estates, which was worth around £4,000. This meant that the £10,000 dowry that had inspired William Cranston to court Mary and eventually led to the death of her father was nothing more than an elaborate rumour. On the 6th of April 1752, Mary Blandy was taken to the gallows. As she climbed the ladder, her last words to her executioners were, Gentlemen, don't hang me too high for the sake of decency. The following day, she was buried with her parents in Henley Parish Church. Captain William Henry Cranston continued to live in France, but on the 2nd of December, 1752, 
just eight months after Mary was executed, he died of natural causes. He left his estate to his wife, Anne Murray, and his daughter. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening. As per usual, please leave any feedback or comments you may have, and I will see you in the next brief case.